Welcome to Ira's Everything Bagel, where I talk with intriguing people about everything, their passions, pursuits, and points of view. Radio used to be magic for creating the theater of the mind, but it was the film industry that gave birth to the physical theater, the brick and mortar buildings where silver screens bring their own magic. One of the signature pioneers of the physical silver screen was Carl Lemley, the film producer, co-founder of Universal Pictures. The Lemley family has presented unique films to the public through its theaters for decades. But the challenges their theaters face in today's world, especially in the aftermath of COVID, is the subject of a film by my guest, Raphael Sparge, director of the new documentary, Only in Theaters. For everything about this film, including screenings at theaters and film festivals throughout the country, go to onlyintheaters.com. And you can follow Raphael on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And Raphael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ira. It's great to be here. Thank you. What a wonderful intro. So appreciate it. Absolutely. I enjoyed the documentary, and I wondered why you picked that subject for a, a really good look at both the film industry in a way, theaters in a way, and a and a family as well. Right. So, you know, Only in Theaters is really a story ultimately about a family business. Um, the family business was what was so appealing to me. Um, initially, what drew me in, and, and you referenced Carl Emley, of course, at the open, which is just, um, there's this astounding legacy story that the Lemleys have. I mean, Carl Lemley, one of the early moguls who really, you know, uh, helped found Hollywood, as it were, um, you know, an immigrant who came to America to sort of try and find his way, an immigrant who went up against the Edison Trust at the time, who was controlling all of the filmmaking, and um, and he went to the Supreme Court and won, which gave us literally birthed in that moment independent cinema. Because of him, we have what we know now as as uh, as cinema, um, and and not controlled by one you know entity like like Edison. In this case, this family, there has been a Lemley in the movie business ever since there's been a movie business, and so just that legacy story was fascinating to me and the family, who. I had encountered as a filmmaker, as many people have, as many, many other folks that I know in Los Angeles who want to show their movies, you want to show it at a Lemley Theaters because it's sort of the gold standard of kind of where, where, you know, where you'll find your audience and, and, and a quality programming and, and what people perceive as being good, really good cinema. And um, so <laughs> what happened uh, was in classic sort of documentary story lore is that I began with one movie and then it turned into something <laughs> entirely else. There were a series of uh, unfortunate and complicating uh, incidents that occurred along the way that we ended up following. And and Greg Lemley, who is the CEO and, you know, really president of Lemley Theatres, who, if you call Lemley Theaters, you will likely get Greg on the phone, which was my experience, as well as, for example, Ava DuVernay, who we reference in the in the in the in this, or uh, you know, Allison Anders. You know, uh, uh, a lot of wonderful filmmakers spoke to us, Cameron Crowe, uh, James Ivory, about how this theater and other theaters like it had influenced them and helped them become directors and want to become directors. Um, theaters are you know, um, sacred spaces for the art form. And, and and this is one of the ones that has been able, you know, has remained. I didn't realize that was the case where you called the theater and you actually got him on the line because I was going to ask you, and if you can expound on that, that you got their cooperation to do this documentary. So clearly it meant something to the family. And it's not just Greg, it's his wife, his sons, his wife, Tish, et cetera. And this is, again, four generations of Lemleys here. So you were able to get Greg on the phone. And once you did, did you pitch the idea to him uh, originally in its format and then it changed over time? Or did you just say, listen, I'm interested in doing something about the Lemley family business as well as what the future holds for cinema? Right. So, well, when I first met Greg, I, was, I actually met him by happenstance. I was doing a documentary about the Los Angeles River, and, and he's a huge advocate of the Los Angeles River, uh, which has got a crazy story, amazing story that most people don't know. And I um, happened to interview him. Um, and he said, oh, I'm Greg Lemley. And I said, oh, my goodness, you know, <laughs> bless you for the work that you do. And and can we can I interview you? And that so and then there was another documentary that I did that he saw um, uh, that also had sort of historical resonances. And and 
ultimately when I approached him, inspired by this great wall that he has in one of his theaters, again, which is sort of a reference, it's referenced in the movie, but it is a point of inspiration. A wonderful artist named Viva Sullivan had had put it together and it, and it really, it leaps out and, and captures your imagination, at least it did mine. But when I, when I, when I called Greg initially, it was because I wanted to screen a movie. Um, and again, I called the Lemley theaters, you know, you, you look them up, you call them. And then I, I got to, you know, I got to the man above the title It's kind of wild, you know, it's like, is... when does that happen? <laughs> but that, but that's, that speaks to this family business, right? That speaks to the care and, and the, and the, this is a fourth generation family business, fourth and fifth generation family business. If you think of his kids and, and, and Carl, I mean, it, it really is a, it is a, it, it's a family whose mission has been about supporting film, the art of film, filmmakers, and the audiences who love this art form, you know, for close to 100 years. And 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 that, um, in of itself, also kind of knocked me out. And and, and then just Greg's sort of very um, direct, unassuming uh, kind of. Um, Clearly, this is a person who wanted to sort of help, you know, for, you know, for the movie that I wanted to screen. And, and and again, so we had sort of evolved this sort of relationship. And then I came back to him and said, look, I, I, I want to do this. And uh, and he said, OK, well, then, you know, come meet my family. So I met his dad, who was 85 at the time, going to work every day, who, of course, you know, uh, you know, the, the, he had run the business for years and is still technically, you know, the president. But 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 he he. Um, he, and then I heard about this great aunt who was 103 at the time, who was a surviving uh, widow of one of the founders. And, and I said, how are they? And, and he said, they're great. They're, they're, they're great. And I said, Greg, we got to go. We got we to gotta, we gotta get them. We got to film them. And this is before I even knew what it was that I would, but I just felt the urgency, uh, the immediacy of the moment to capture them. And, and um, again, uh, we did that very quickly, and, and then things happened. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I, there's a wonderful uh, filmmaker named Ira Deutschman. Um, he's also a professor and and, a, and really a film person. And he said, you know, there's two kinds of documentaries. This is the kind of documentary where you 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 have your idea and you know what you're going to do and you film it. The other kind is where you kind of don't know where you're going, but you sort of let it happen. The far riskier way. <laughs> and and I. And we shot this over two and a half years, right? I mean, this was um, not every day, obviously, but it, over a span. And, and and we, in doing so, captured something that was really, um, you know, I think a moment in time. And, and, and then backed into a zeitgeist, which is at this point, what is the future of movie theaters? What's happening with streaming and all the other influences on on exhibition and and, and how and now post pandemic, how can we get back into the habit of going to the movies? It's, you know, people have gotten very attached to their couches <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, don't want to get, and, um, you know, we've lost touch with what is the movie experience. You know, I mean, I I I think about how. You know, when you when you sit there and you watch, you know, something on your device, um, I, to me, it's sort of the equivalent of like burger. It's like burger and you eat it, you know. It's <laughs> right. It's not fine dining. <laughs> it's referred to as binging, right? I'm binge watching, right? Which is perfect, right? When you go to a movie in a theater, you're having an experience. You're, you're in, you know, basically real estate that's dedicated to really preserving um, that exchange, you come in with strangers um, in the dark and, and you leave as friends because you have a shared experience. The screen is 60 feet and, and it, 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 we are diminutive in its against the size of the screen. And it gives us, again, the ability to kind of really lift off and, and, and really fall into, again, this vision that this director has, whatever it is. And, and, and these things are um, important and subtler aspects of what going to a movie is, but they're an important part of it that I think we've forgotten about. And and, and um, so again, that that was not what this movie was about initially, but because so much has come down and because now we're faced at a real flexion point with many, many, many movie theaters closing forever, forever. And there's no going back. Like in New York City, there's a, it's a beautiful theater called Sinopolis, huge in Chelsea, Closed forever. Um, you know, Lincoln Plaza, which was arguably, you know, one of the most important, you know, independent cinemas in, 
in in the country. It's been shuttered for five years. It still says Lincoln Plaza, and there's nothing there. The, the billionaire owner doesn't want to put anything in there. I mean, it, it, so there, there are there are so many. Um, the film is suffering. You know, we as audience members are suffering, and and filmmakers are suffering. I don't know any director who doesn't want to show their movie in a theater. And so um, this is a you know this is a um, an important moment to be reminded. Do you think though, Raphael, that perhaps the future of mass cinema is over and the typical blockbusters that are distributed and there's a niche there or a niche there for the art film, the independent film, the documentary. And if it's done in a Lenly theater that in, in effect, they, they could withstand the demise or the diminution of cinema, the mass cinema, but still have a very unique segment there of people willing to support it, go to the theaters and watch directors like you and others with their special films or documentaries? Well, that, that's certainly the hope. I mean, we're, we're at an interesting point of kind of um, non sequiturs in a way, because, you know, oddly, over the past few years, we've had the highest grossing films ever, ever. I mean, Avatar and Spider-Man and, and, and Top Gun and th these movies have brought in enormous crowds, but these are tempo movies. Um, the smaller independent films, um, I, I, you know, some of the audience is older um, and, 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 and been more sensitive to COVID and not wanting to be in crowds um, or again, have, have gotten out of the habit of going out. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, a healthy, a, a health, this art form deserves a healthy, um, uh, full full color uh, opportunity to have both you know uh big splashy movies and also wonderful thoughtful artful films um that's what it's been for so long the the the, the challenge is um how do we keep the the theaters there uh particularly and again this is where it goes back to the family business mm -hmm. um many family businesses were, were impacted during COVID. Many of them, you know, whether it be dry cleaners or, you know, pizza parlors or, you know, on and on, everyone was, you know, these businesses were squeezed. And and the the question has been, how, how do they survive? And, and so, you know, for those of us who love movies, who love going to movies, who, who understand the love affair uh, of, you know the popcorn, the seats, the trailers, the 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 kind of the way in which it kind of gives you a mental vacation because you're away from your phone and your all the distractions and the dings and the buzz buzzes and the words that are in our daily life. That we that that it's a that it's a magical thing that's that occurs in that moment and and that we're interested in preserving that. How do we remind people to kind of come back? And 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 that really, you know, there's sort of a cause ultimately that sort of bubbled up uh, underneath this. So yes, um, theaters like the Lemleys, if they can exist, continue to exist, um, they they provide the alternative. The, the problem is um, that a lot of them are are suffering at this point um, in a in a big way. You mentioned about the the people that normally would go because of COVID and the older generation, in a sense. It would seem that maybe part of the solution would be to market to younger generations about the uniqueness of a cinema experience in a theater with art films, independent films, documentaries, et cetera. Uh, I don't know who would spearhead that, uh, but I think maybe that's another approach one could take is to get people in their 20s and 30s much more interested in unique films than just the temple movies you mentioned earlier. Well, I mean, again, interestingly, um, you know, everything everywhere all at once, which won everything everywhere all at once um, at the at the Oscars. Um, uh, that was uh, the highest grossing independent film ever. And and that had a huge younger audience. I mean, it's, you know, mom becomes a superhero and goes into the Matrix. Right. So this is uh, this was a had a huge appeal visually. So um, uh, thrilling and and um, was, I think, an opportunity for people to come in. I. Um, I believe that there's work to be done. I believe that there's, you know, more opportunities to be had. I, I also, and this, we talk about this in the film, which is sort of the interesting, perhaps historical resonance is that, you know, when television came along in the fifties um, 
everything collapsed at that point, right? Um, all of the uh, movie theaters, which were all the neighborhood theaters at the time. I mean, the Lemleys had a circuit of seven and went down to one. Uh, the two brothers who were running the business wanted to leave the business and the other one took over. Um, there was a sort of a sense of, uh, you know, it would never come back. And it did. It did. And and there's been kind of a call of, well, it's all over. It's all, it's, you know, it's, it's done. It's toast. It's, you know, you know, whether it be VHS or DVDs or, you know, there's been a lot of funerals uh, sort of predicted for movie theaters. Uh, you know, the, the, the fact is that there is nothing quite like it. So the, the hope um, is that perhaps with, with some, kind of rejiggering and us getting farther and farther away from our pandemic fears and, and us rem being reminded of how wonderful it is to go to the theaters and, and how important it is, um, uh, not just for us, but, you know, for lots of other people as well, including filmmakers, um, that that it that it's a way to kind of, that it will continue to grow and, and that it will be cool, you know, for the younger generations. Oh, we got to go to a movie. You know, it's better. <laughs> it's cool. Way to see it. Do you think part of the problem is, and this is more with the, the mass theater chains, I know that when I go to a movie theater, I time it so I don't have to sit through 10 minutes of trailers that are at extreme volume and also commercials and also 9 million messages before we get to the film. I, I think if you tailor that experience to the way it used to be 20, 30, 40 years ago, where you, yes, you may have a trailer or two, but not 10 minutes of trailers and not commercials necessarily, and there was more attention paid to the film itself as why you're there. I, I, I would think that that would help a little bit. I, I agree. I mean, again, that's that's you know the economics are. I mean, and I'm not advocating any of that because I I agree with you, and it is so loud. Um, is the um, I know the part of, you know the the commercials give the money theater, so it's it's a it's a um uh give money to the theater so that it's a way for them it's a you know it's an, another ancillary income stream um i think more trailers also provide i think additional income so i i but the independent you know the independent chains the the the, the theaters in in the various towns around the country that are like lemley maybe not you know maybe people who listen to this have no idea about Lemley, wouldn't know a Lemley if they stood up in their soup, you know, in this case, but there are Lemleys in different cities. There's one in Chicago and one in Atlanta and one in, you know, and, and, and in San Francisco. I mean, there are independent cinemas in cities all over the country. And, and those cinemas um, are the kinds of program, I think, you know, more intelligently and, and don't uh, clobber us uh, with, you know, uh, the heavy handed approach to, you know, come to the next movie. Yeah. What was the reaction of Greg and the family when you finished the documentary? I, I'm assuming you gave him a private screening to see it. And I, I, I may be wrong, but I assume that's what you did. Uh, or maybe they wanted to see it in the theater along with everybody else for the first time. You tell me. <laughs> it's really interesting what you say. So, so first of all, Greg has screened hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documentary films. He certainly knows um, what's involved. Um, when I approached him, uh, he said yes. Um, he just had no editorial control, put no money in the film. It was complete. I mean, we maintained our journalistic integrity, as it were, by by maintaining a distance. And um, we uh, provided, um, at some point, I said, Greg, do you want to see this? And he said, no. He said, I want to see it for the first time in front of an audience. Um, and that was in front of the Santa Barbara Film Festival when we premiered last year on this time. And, and um, um <laughs> I have to imagine it was pretty tough. I mean, he, he has said since it was a it was a little challenging. Um, I you know because it, it's it's personal and and it, and he really let us in, and 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 there are things that are not attractive <laughs> and are not about you know uh, trying to put the best face forward. They're they're tough, but they're real. And and, and again, that was their commitment to this. Um, so. Their their reaction now um, after that initial I think cold shower um, is that he's you know he's really embraced it and and, I, and I'm and I'm uh, I'm you know look uh, you can't spend two and a half years with a family and not uh, grow some attachment and some feelings for them I certainly have um, what I tried to do was you know again show them. Uh, show them with their with their faults and their quirks and their and their foibles but 
uh, again, I, I believe that it it becomes recognizable of every family. You know, every family has its complexities. That said, it's a very loving family. Um, but but I also believe that Greg has because he's gotten so much feedback. We've gotten wonderful reviews, um, you know, everywhere, um, and, and we've played it internationally as well as all over the country. Um, and and we have uh, so many theater owners, e even in cities like we played Bethlehem, PA. You know, a sort of a a ravaged steel town, right? I mean, the you know, the remnants of it is there. They were overwhelmed. They were so moved by this. And 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 town after town, city after city, we've we've played almost 80 cities at this point, have said, this is so moving. Your story was our story. And I and I and I believe that he's actually sort of become um really embraced it and 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 realized that it's it's an opportunity for a conversation to challenge people's way of thinking and maybe encourage them to sort of think uh you know really give theaters a second look and really reconsider their choices and how powerful it is um their decision to go to movie theaters how how to empower them and remind them of why why they need to so i i i believe he's really embraced it and i'm and i'm really i'm really grateful for that but I can understand that first reaction because, again, it's very personal and he can feel defensive or whatever he's feeling. But I assume, though, he always felt that you were doing the right thing in that you weren't exploiting the family. You were doing a documentary and making the point. And I think that's what leveled it out was if if you were exploiting them, then, then they might be defensive and stay that way. But once they realized what you have in the documentary... And they heard from other people as well. They're not part of the family, but just saw the documentary and saw why it was good, that that's why he embraced it, as you said. Yeah, I mean, he saw my other work. And so he sort of knew my sensibility. And and I so he said um, now, and and um, he, um, you know, he, he said he'd been approached by many other filmmakers, like, you know, someone should make a documentary. And he said, I was the first one to come in and say, I want to make a documentary. I'm doing this. and and so. Um, you know, he, um, uh, I, and, and, and honestly, had we started bef a little bit after or before, we might not have actually sort of had this very specific kind of ride that we had, uh, which include, you know, it's really a roller coaster that, that occurred. And, and, uh, and I, somehow I just trusted that the end would, would reveal itself. I, I didn't know where it was. My girlfriend thought I was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it has. I you would say you could say roller coaster, but it's an organic process that you went through, as opposed to scripting the whole thing ahead of time and then shooting the documentary to fit what you've scripted. You were oh yeah, you were intuitive enough to realize that wait a minute, things are changing here and shifting, and I've just got to go along with it and see where we end up. Because that, that's the thing is, you know, what I've learned is that you know. You start a documentary with an idea, and I've had other filmmakers tell me this, is at some point the documentary tells you what it wants to be. It's like, we're going that way. Now, you can go that way, but we're going that way. And at that point, right? right. So I, I was, oh, my God. So I had to, I mean, I didn't have the funding to do that. I had to figure it out. I had to scramble. I put a bunch of my own money in. And we, you know, made all sorts of deals with filmmakers who were working on it. Like, okay, I don't, you know, like. I don't even know this, but would you go with me? And 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 some just remarkable people just said yes. We'll continue to show up. We'll continue to be there because they believed in what this was going to be. But it it really was a it really as you say you I had we had to follow our intuition and kind of just sort of travel with it and and, and hope that it that it would end up you know um, in the right place. Um, but I, I do believe you're right. Is that Greg knew that I. I wasn't doing this for an ulterior motive. I didn't have anything other than just wanting to tell a story. And again, the family just moved the heck out of me, who they were. You know, my my family is an immigrant Ukrainian family, came to this United you know, States and opened the family business. It was a schmata business, you know, it was a, it was a clothing in the, the garments of script in, in, in the Bronx. And the, there was something very familiar to me, you know, about it. And and that's what I that's what I connected to. Yeah, there's always that empathetic approach where you connect on various levels. A lot of documentarians, I think, come in clinically. And I think it it's better to sometimes have that empathy. And even if you're showing the unvarnished truth, at least it's connected to that empathy. So you have you have the hard truth and but you have the feeling as well about these people that you're shooting a documentary on. Did the rest of the family like it in terms of the two sons? 
and his wife as well? Yes, they were very moved. I mean, I I was, you know, look, uh, I was nervous, right? Um, when I finished, like, here it is. <laughs> like three, three years of my life. Um, I hope you. Uh, and, um, yeah, I mean, Tish Lumley uh, loves it and, and has championed it as well. Um, um, and been a you know been a part of the Q and A's that we're doing around the country. Um, there, there are two sons. There are three sons. Um, I've spoken to two. Both have been very moved. The third one I heard also loved it. And um, so, you know, I think I think um, I honestly believe that in a way, you know, the the movie is very timely, right at the mo- right at the moment. But it may even be more. It, it may be a film that even 10 years from now I think could be very surprisingly moving in terms of it having captured kind of a moment in time that was very you know impactful uh for the world uh and for the family um and I and I you know again that that's that was magic and serendipity and and just the way things went I have one last question, but before I ask that one, I want to reference your upcoming documentary, 10 Days in Watts, and I'll put a link to the trailer on the website, ivorseverythingbagel.com, and so people can see it. Just for about 30 seconds, if you could just give us a sense of what the documentary is about, and then I have a final question about the Lemley family. Yeah, Uh, 10 Days in Watts is a PBS docuseries, which is currently now on pbs.org, but it's also, I believe... um, on various other outlets, I think they're also on on YouTube and 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 um, on kcet.org. Um, but it it is a it's basically about another family. It's a it's another uh, multi generational family in Watts, uh, arguably you know a neighborhood with a perception issue. Uh, but it's a very uplifting story about a farm that opens right in the two and a half acre farm right in the middle of Watts. And, and it's a it's a portrait of the neighborhood and this beautiful community center that's there. And then this family who really has uh, dedicated their lives to helping the community. Um, so 10 days in Watts, it's, I'm very proud of it. That's great. My last question, will there be another, from your perspective, with everything you know, will there be another generation of Lemleys continuing on with the theaters? Right. So that's the big question. So Greg Lemmy's got three sons and, and, you know, like you've got three years. So I certainly the family business will, well, so one of them is in law school, um, super bright and doing extremely well. Um, The other one's uh, a novelist currently living uh, in Mexico and really being sort of a, uh, uh, a wanderer, I think. And kind of finding (laughs) (laughs) way. I think he's living, you know, living life and and enjoying himself. Um, And um, I, I don't think he has a, 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 a passionate career path yet. Um, uh, and the third one uh, has worked as a film distributor um, and is now working as a nonprofit. But interestingly, and this is late breaking, I just heard from Tish that um, she asked that son, um, his name is Gabe, and said, you know, Gabe, if anything happened to your dad, you know, and he wasn't able to do this, would you, how would you feel about, you know, taking this over? Would you, would you step in? He said, in a minute. Nice. Absolutely in a minute. I- Nice. So, so they're in their twenties, and and you know we're all finding our ways in our twenties, and and perhaps um, uh, that will evolve. Uh, but but um, at the moment, Greg's thriving, and I think um, you know people are seeing how uh, his mission, how impactful his mission is, and are coming back to the theaters, and and we remain uh, positive and hopeful and and determined to kind of continue to see it through. Well, that's a great way to leave it. My guest has been Raphael Sparge director of the new documentary, Only in Theaters. For everything about this film, including screenings and festivals throughout the country, go to onlyintheaters.com, onlyintheaters.com, and you can follow Raphael on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Raphael, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Ira. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. And join us every Thursday for a new schmear on Ira's Everything Bagel.